Good morning and happy Wednesday. Thank you for joining us today for the next Region 7 Disaster Health Response Ecosystem Preparedness Webinar Series. Today we'll be talking about the Special Pathogen Global Outbreaks, Identifying the Risk and Impacts to Region 7. Um, so today we're going to uh, review some special pathogens that remain a potential all around the world and then also discuss their impact on Region 7 and the role of the Region 7 Emerging Special Pathogen Treatment Center based out of Nebraska Medicine and UNMC. Objectives for today are to summarize the current special pathogen outbreaks globally and how they have impacted communities, discuss the roles and responsibilities of the healthcare team members during special pathogen outbreaks within the RESPECT, and then identify the services and resources associated with the Region 7 Special Pathogen Treatment Center. Uh, today's webinar is accredited for one CEU for physicians, nurses, and EMS, so we will provide the continuing education information in the chat towards the end of the webinar. Disclosure declaration. Uh, only disclosure for today for faculty is Dr. Hewlett, which is on the screen, and then also planning committee for Dr. Lawler. And then if you have any questions during the webinar, please place your questions in the Q&A and not the chat, and we'll monitor the Q&A during the webinar and then also do a facilitated Q&A towards the end. And then I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Hewlett and do a brief introduction. So Dr. Hewlett is a professor of internal Medicine and Infectious Disease at the University of Nebraska Medical Center and the University of Nebraska College of Public Health. And she's also the George and Linda Orr Chair in Health Security. She currently serves as the Medical Director of the Nebraska Biocontainment Unit, where she's actively participated in the care of several patients with Ebola virus disease and has since provided subject matter expertise through the National Emerging Special Pathogen Training and Education Center, the SHEA CDC Outbreak Response Training Program, and multiple other national and international biopreparedness advisory groups and venues. And then our other presenter today is Jackson Gruber, and Jackson has experience in the Emergency Services Department with four years as a nationally registered EMT and has valuable experience working in the COVID intensive care unit. He currently serves as the Regional Special Pathogens Program Coordinator at Nebraska Medicine with coordination and operational accountability for the Regional Emerging Special Pathogen Treatment Center and the National Quarantine Unit. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Hewlett. All right, thank you very much, Lauren, and um, and yeah, welcome. I, I was asked to actually give a, a, a discussion today and kind of talk about some of the special pathogens um, that you may or may not uh, end up uh, dealing with in your facilities. Um, this is something, though, that we all need to be ready for, and I think even though some of these things you may very well never see in your lifetime, it is something that um, that these are diseases that are out there, and they're things that um, uh, that you know. Again, we all need to be prepared for and be doing our um, tribal screening and all the appropriate things to make sure that we identify patients uh, that potentially uh, could be infected with these special pathogens. So um, I did, uh, uh, my disclosures were listed previously. I essentially have research support for um, a variety of different um, uh, studies uh, that all paid to my institution. And objectives today, so, you know, again, talk about some of the special pathogens and some of the current outbreaks and give some situation updates of what is going on in the world. And then um, talk about the role of the Region 7 Special Pathogen Treatment Center, um, so UNMC Nebraska Medicine, during these outbreaks. And then talk about um, uh, how we can participate in outreach, education, and training um, through our, our, throughout Region 7. And so first of all, we all know that things are out there, right? I mean, we hear these things in the news. Um, some of them don't always make the news, but there are many special pathogens out there. Um, you know, the, you can see the outbreaks that have just occurred just in 2022, 2023. I know we're all familiar with um, MPOX uh, and, and the, um, the impact that that had, uh, not only here in the United States, but around the world. But there's lots of other things going on as well. And I think, again, we all need to be aware of these things and, um, and be at least have some baseline knowledge of, um, of presenting symptoms and, um, and how we can potentially detect, um, you know, individuals that are infected with, with these pathogens because, you know, travel is out there and obviously you can be anywhere in the world in a day or so. And so this is something that, again, um, regardless of the size of your facility, uh, we need to be, you know, aware of this and, um, and kind of ready, ready for whatever comes. And so I'm going to start actually with a coronavirus. So, um, you know, I know that we've all heard a lot about coronaviruses over the last three years, but um, we're, we're going to change gears a little bit and talk about MERS-CoV, which is Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Um, and I'm not sure, again, how th this was in the news a lot um, about 10 years ago. Um, it's still, um, you know, definitely there are still cases out there and they surface every once in a while, mostly in the Arabian Peninsula. 
But as I mentioned, this is a coronavirus. Um, uh, it causes a severe respiratory viral infection, um, not unlike COVID-19 actually um, in the more severe stages. Um, it was first identified in Saudi Arabia in 2012. And then since then, there have been about 2,600 confirmed cases um, as of last December, affecting 27 different countries around the world. Um, the difference between this and um, what we know as uh, COVID-19 is that the case fatality of MERS-CoV is thought to be around 30-35%. And so this is very, very significant and very different than what we've seen um, with COVID-19, just in the fact that this is a very high case fatality, you know, when you think about one in three individuals um, uh, possibly succumbing to this illness if they become infected. Um, interestingly, this is transmitted through also potentially not only through the respiratory route, but also uh, contact with camels. And so this is something that I put a picture of a camel there, you know, lots of people who travel overseas and go to the Arabian Peninsula um, have contact with camels. There's lots of occupational hazards that are associated with camel contact. Um, you know, you can also acquire this through uh, contact with an infected person, so human to human transmission. Um, often healthcare associated, it, it does seem that MERS-CoV is less transmissible in a lot of cases compared to say um, uh, COVID-19. That being said, there are definitely cases of super spreaders as well. And I'll talk about one of those in just a second. So mean incubation period um, for MERS-CoV is about five days or so. There's an incredibly wide spectrum of illness, um, very similar to COVID-19 in that some people have very minimal symptoms and others can progress to more severe disease. Um, generally though, the clinical presentation is fever, cough, and shortness of breath. Um, the GI symptoms, so gastroenteritis, uh, you know, diarrhea, things like that are actually relatively prominent with MERS-CoV. Um, and then some cases do progress to hypoxic respiratory failure and then kind of multi-organ failure um, in, those, in those severe cases. Uh, diagnosis is by PCR. Um, similar to, um, to uh, COVID-19. And then treatment is really supportive care. There aren't any specific licensed antiviral agents uh, that are available to treat MERS-CoV. Um, and there is a vaccine in clinical trials, actually a few, but, um, but currently there is nothing approved uh, vaccination-wise for MERS-CoV. And so this is the story of a super spreader. And I actually took this picture. Um, it was a, a, an interesting trip, actually. We were able to visit um, one of the hospitals in Seoul in South Korea. And this is also kind of illustrates the, the concerning things about cases that um, you know, may present into emergency departments. So they have a very busy emergency department, very busy hospital, large uh, you know, hospital, very well equipped um, with a large infection control department and kind of every, all the stuff. And, um, uh, but they did have one, they had an individual who was a traveler from Saudi Arabia who landed in Seoul, um, returned actually um, to Seoul where, um, where, he was, uh, where he was from and actually ended up visiting multiple healthcare facilities, uh, multiple emergency departments, ended up infecting about 186 subsequent cases actually um, were what resulted from that. And several of those were in healthcare workers, there were some deaths. It was a very significant you know, scenario and this was, um, was essentially a super spreader. And so we've, you know, we've heard a lot about that, but um, again, an individual showed up uh, into an emergency department, a busy emergency department, and ended up um, spreading this disease to, um, to a lot of other people. So again, just illustrates the need to, to make sure that we're, that we're asking about travel, that we're asking our patients when they present, um, you know, if they've traveled anywhere in the world. And so as far as situation updates go uh, with MERS-CoV, you know, these cases will continue. They have kind of simmered over in, um, in uh, the kind of Saudi Arabia, Arabian Peninsula area, and they're probably going to be, continue to be sporadic imported cases throughout the world, um, just due to travel. You know, some of these places are very frequently traveled. And so, you know, you can see the distribution of cases there it seems to be decreasing a bit. Um, that being said, you know, who knows what will happen with this because it's been around since 2012 and, um, and you know, still sort of, you know, we're still seeing cases of MERS-CoV out there. So, um, so again, something to, to remember. So I'm gonna move on to MPOX, which I know we've all heard a lot about over the last year or so. So this is an orthopox um, virus. And so it's a double-stranded DNA virus. Um, that that uh, group of viruses actually includes smallpox. It includes vaccinia, which is what um, the viral strain that's used in the smallpox vaccine, as well as cowpox. And this is not a new virus in any way. It was discovered in 1958 um, in monkeys. And the first human case was in 1970 in what is now the Democratic Republic of the Congo in Africa, um, formerly known as Zaire. 
Um, they reservoir of this is really not known, although it's thought maybe there's a rodent reservoir, but definitely it can be transmitted to humans as we've all seen over the last year. So transmission is typically by respiratory droplet um, and then direct contact with bodily fluids and then also indirect contact. And I know we've heard a lot about this in the news um, with infected materials. So things like infected clothing, linens, um, also contact with infected animals can potentially transmit this as well. And monkeypox or mpox has actually two different clades. Um, we were fortunate enough, I would say, that this most recent large outbreak that was the worldwide outbreak was actually the West African clade as opposed to the Central African because the Central African clade typically has more severe clinical manifestations. Um, it's a little bit easier to transmit and it has a higher mortality rate. Um, but we did not see that as much with the, um, the most recent outbreak. And again, uh, because that was the West African clade that was involved with that. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of sort of textbook clinical features of MPOX, which differ from what, um, what we've actually seen over the last year in our patients. And so textbook wise, you know, incubation period anywhere between five and 21 days. So pretty can be a long incubation period. And then typically patients will have a prodrome of some sort. So they'll have maybe fevers and chills, body aches, just feel generally poor, um, have uh, maybe some swelling of the lymph nodes as well. And then after a few days of that, then the characteristic rash develops. And you can see some pictures there on the right, um, you know, well circumscribed kind of firm, you know, firm lesions. And then those lesions uh, progress. They initially start as more of a kind of a red, um, uh, what we call a macule, so sort of a, a red, you know, dot lesion. And then they go and progress into what you see there in the, um, in the pictures on the right. Um, typically, the, most of these lesions are on the head and also on the extremities. Um, they're most prominent in those, those uh, areas, but can, can occur anywhere on the body. And then this is usually a self-limited disease. The illness usually lasts um, between two and four weeks. And then it does have a mortality rate between one and 10%, and that depends on the clade involved um, and the severity of illness. Now I'm going to tell you kind of what we've seen over the last year, which differs a bit from that. So, you know, as far as the prodrome goes, some patients have that, some don't have anything at all. They may not recall any sort of symptoms at all prior to development of the rash. The rash can be very atypical, so it doesn't show up like those pictures that I showed you before in all cases. In fact, in most cases, actually, um, the rash has been uh, very different in that the lesions can be you know, in uh, different areas. So depending on the route of transmission, um, the lesions have, we've seen lesions in the genital and perianal areas in particular, um, lots of other kind of associated clinical findings, uh, things like proctitis or um, ulcers, you know, sometimes looking like even a cancer or something, a rectal cancer. I mean, it, it's been a, a wide variety of lesions uh, seen. Uh, definitely some oral lesions, and then the lesions can be in very different stages of progression. So that progression that I discussed a second ago is textbook, but in actuality, that, that is not always the case. And then some people have very few lesions, maybe a single one, and they can be um, really mistaken for lots of things. And I've seen these patients clinically, and I can tell you, you know, they could look like flea bites or um, a folliculitis, just a skin infection. Um, and so it definitely uh, can be a little tricky, actually, to pick up these patients sometimes. And so there's a thought that they're also asymptomatic individuals that have no symptoms at all, but can still potentially transmit this. And then there are different routes of transmission that have been reported, as I'm sure some of you have seen in, um, in the media reports. So just some, some pictures here of different clinical manifestations, um, you know, oral and perioral lesions, different perianal rectal lesions, things like that. So if you do have someone who presents um, to your emergency department with these sorts of things. They still could be other things, but, um, but something to remember that MPOX is still out there. So diagnosing MPOX, I know we've all had some experience with this over the last year, I would imagine, um, or at least your institutions probably have. So PCR, and you get this from the, uh, the lesions themselves. So they're like a roof of the vesicle uh, where you can sample that and actually send for PCR. Uh, treatment of MPOX is actually has pretty much been narrowed down to the tecoviramat um, uh, drug, uh, which is an antiviral agent. You can see some others listed up there, but tecoviramat is the one that has really been used um, in, for this outbreak in the vast majority of patients. Um, there are some vaccine options to prevent um, uh, uh, severe MPOX and, um, and MPOX in general. And you can see the difference between the a vaccine like the ACAM2000, which is a smallpox vaccine, which also can prevent um, prevent MPOX, but it is a live vaccine. And there you can see there's some, some of the, the kind of issues that, um, that exist with that vaccine. 
And so the Genios vaccine is the vaccine that's been used mostly in this outbreak. And that is, um, is a bit different from the live vaccine in that it's what we call replication deficient. And so it doesn't have as many of the risk factors and, and as many of the, um, the adverse events uh, associated with the more, uh, like with the ACAM and other live vaccines. And so that's given as a two dose series um, about a month apart. And then Genios has actually been utilized both pre and post exposure um, for prophylaxis. So if you know that someone has been exposed, you could potentially um, give post exposure prophylaxis within four days. And this is actually really important for healthcare workers. Um, and then also for pre exposure prophylaxis and, and high risk groups as well. And so just situation update of MPOX, you know, the outbreak continues in Western Central Africa where it is endemic. Um, in 2022 through now, there have been 87,000 cases actually reported out of 111 countries. So most of these cases have been reported in, um, in certain risk groups, uh, men who have sex with men, although definitely not exclusively. And so that you know, you, we could easily see and have seen MPOX in, in other, other groups as well. Um, as I mentioned before, the kind of relatively mild clinical presentation can kind of throw us off a bit um, just because it is not necessarily presenting like the textbook. And although cases have markedly decreased over the last year since this outbreak began in, in May of 2022, um, they are still occurring. And you've probably seen some reports in the news of, of, you know, kind of cases popping up around the United States and the world. So still something we need to keep on our radar. And so I'm going to move on now to viral hemorrhagic fevers, my, my favorite topic. Um, and I'm going to talk about actually three, Lassa fever, Marburg, Ebola, oh, sorry, four, uh, Crimean Congo, actually, I threw in there as well, just because that's been in the news lately. Um, and we all need to kind of, you know, have some baseline knowledge on it as well. So first of all, Lassa fever. So um, Lassa is a virus that actually is also not a new virus. None of these are. Um, it was recognized in 1969 in Nigeria. There are a lot of cases in West Africa every year. And you can see the map there. Um, there are typically around 5,000 deaths associated with Lassa in West Africa. Um, you know, they actually estimate that up to 16% of all hospitalizations in that area could be due to loss of fever. And then there's a high prevalence in the general population of, um, of antibody to loss. So this is something that, you know, that is out there for sure in West Africa. There are lots of cases that are occurring every year. Uh, the host is, uh, is a rat and you can see the picture there. I'm um, not so not so ugly, but um, but this is a bad disease. Uh, and um, the transmission, though, interestingly, of loss uh, can be from person to person. You know, healthcare workers. Um, you know, close contact with with infected individuals, but also can actually occur. And the typical mode of transmission initially occurs through ingestion or inhalation of uh, rat secretion. So rat droppings. Um, you know, a rat urine, things like that. So somebody sweeping out an old barn or a house or, you know, something like that where, uh, where there, this rat has been, uh, has been uh, there's an infestation there. And so incubation period of this one, and actually this, you know, for the most part, the viral hemorrhagic fevers all have very similar uh, clinical presentations, at least in, in uh, the severe forms. And so typically between two and 21 days, usually around a week or a bit longer. Um, most of the loss infections, as opposed to some of the other viral hemorrhagics that I'll talk about, are actually pretty mild. Um, they, patients may have fever, headache, malaise, um, you know, but 20% of those patients actually go on to develop more severe disease, which can lead to multi-organ failure and shock and, uh, you know, uh, and, and potentially death. Um, only 1% of loss of virus infections actually do result in death. So this has a much lower mortality rate than the other viral hemorrhagic fevers that I'll talk about. Um, at least the, the next two, but um, but you know if you are hospitalized for Lassa, so if you go on to develop disease severe enough to be hospitalized, then you know mortality rate is is still relatively high. Um, diagnosis is by PCR. Uh, treatment is very supportive, although um, ribavirin has been tried. But depending on who you talk to, that is either helpful or not helpful. If um, if it is going to help, it has to be given very early in the disease, and so that's an important thing to recognize this disease early, so that we could potentially uh, give some treatment. Uh, there are no licensed vaccines for this, but they are in clinical trials. And so situation update, again, this is endemic in West Africa also. There will continue to be cases seen there. Um, we have seen sporadic and reported cases around the world. Um, there were a couple of cases in the UK, South Africa in 2022, um, and these are all in travelers. And so again, another reason to ask your travel questions uh, when you're seeing patients in the emergency department or in, in clinics. So I'm gonna move on to Marburg, also of our hemorrhagic fever. And this one has been in the news a whole lot lately um, for good reason. 
So this one also was recognized in 1967, actually through a laboratory outbreak um, uh, initially, where there were some laboratory workers that be, were exposed to some primates that were infected with Marburg. And they were actually doing research on polio, interestingly. Um, the host of this are actually fruit bats, um, primates, and humans. So you can see the, the picture of the, of the bat there. Um, risk factors for Marburg are things like visiting caves where bats are dwelling, uh, mines, you know, things like that in different uh, parts of Africa where this disease is endemic, um, you know, close contact with infected persons, including uh, healthcare workers. Um, again, the healthcare workers are at risk for this when caring for patients. And so similar to Lhasa, incubation period is between two and 21 days, usually around a week or so. And the initial symptoms are very nonspecific, um, you know, fever, chills, headache, myalgias, things that kind of a, a typical, a typical illness, a viral illness would, uh, would manifest as, but then followed by uh, potentially a rash, um, sometimes some gastrointestinal symptoms, um, chest pain, sore throat, and then potentially if this disease goes on to be severe, which it definitely can, um, with a case fatality pretty high, actually, anywhere between 23 and 90 percent, depending on which outbreak you look at. Um, it can progress to shock and, and multi-organ failure as well. Diagnosis is by PCR. Uh, treatment is supportive. We don't have any licensed therapeutics for Marburg, and we have no licensed vaccines, but they are in, uh, in development. And so I know that we've, you know, we've seen some of this, as I mentioned in the news, um, due to this scenario in 2022, um, where there were some cases in Ghana, as well as the most recent scenario in 2023, uh, where there were a fair number of cases actually in both Equatorial Guinea and Tanzania simultaneously. And you can kind of see that those outbreaks were both declared over in uh, earlier this month. Um, but that being said, this was a real wake-up call because we really had not seen a lot of Marburg, um, you know, recently in recent history. Um, up until 2022, and these were in, you know, three distinct parts of Africa. And so just, you know, again, something to have on our radar. Um, the outbreak in Guinea, or Equatorial Guinea, was especially uh, concerning just because there were some unknown transmission chains there. So, you know, in other words, there were people who didn't know that they'd been exposed to anyone who was sick. Um, you know, just a, a really, a really concerning scenario. Fortunately, that looks like that it's over, um, but this will be back uh, like, like any, any of the viral hemorrhagics that I'm going to talk about today. So I'm actually through these slides in a bit as, as um, some new slides. I, I do this presentation a fair amount to different groups, but Crimean Congo is something that I think we should all have on our radar for good reason, because we're seeing more cases of this, and you may have seen some of cases of this reported recently. Um, this is a zoonotic disease, so this uh, tick-borne disease. So unlike the other ones that I talked about, there were the primary transmission um, is either through other types of infected animals or rats or things like that. This is actually usually a tick transmission. Has a case fatality between 10 and 40%, so very significant. Um, and the hosts are typically wild or domestic animals as well as humans. Um, risk factors for this are pretty much animal contact and contact with ticks. So this is can be an occupational hazard, um, livestock industry, you know, people who have close contact with animals um, through their work. Um, or close contact with infected persons or bodily fluids. So, you know, potentially healthcare workers in that scenario when you're caring for uh, individuals that are infected and then potentially uh, improper sterilization of medical equipment. There have actually been some cases uh, resulting from that as well. Um, this disease is endemic in Africa and a few different parts of the world, actually Middle East, Asia, um, you know, so you can kind of see that, that this is, and I'll show you a map later, that this is kind of all over the world. And so it's another thing that is, uh, or at least in that general area, it's important to, to, to ask your tribal questions. So you can see the, um, the ecology listed there. And this is a, what's called a hard tick, um, is the, uh, the typical vector for this. Um, it's a reservoir and a vector, so it's able to spread, um, spread through that route. And so if you are bit by a tick or um, you know, it bites an animal and then um, you have a lot of contact with that animal that's sick, then that's how this is typically transmitted. So incubation period is anywhere between two days and uh, two weeks. And it's estimated that 88% of infections actually are subclinical. So they can have very mild symptoms in this disease. Um, initially, you know, very nonspecific. So fever, headaches, myalgia is kind of like some of the other things. Photophobia, interestingly, so a sensitivity to light uh, is something that's, that's commonly seen. And then that though can be followed by more severe disease that can progress on to severe symptoms like shock and multi-organ failure as with the other viral hemorrhagic fevers. Uh, diagnosis is by PCR, treatment is supportive, or potentially ribavirin. Ribavirin's kind of tried for everything. I think you'll probably notice that. Um, and there are no approved vaccines for this either, but it, they are in development. 
And so this is a map, so it's endemic in lots of countries. You know, a lot of these countries, some of these are very heavily traveled countries. In 2023, there have been 139 cases um, in Iraq so far uh, with 20 deaths. And so this is, a, again, a significant disease and one that, um, that can result from travel to a lot of different countries. And so something that we, um, we should all be paying attention to. And I think we're going to see continue to see more cases of this as well. So um, not only do we need to ask the travel related questions, but we also need to ask if they've had exposure to ticks or, you know, tick bites, um, rats, you know, you name it. All the infectious diseases questions um, are important here. And so lastly, I'm going to discuss Ebola. Um, and so this is something that I know that we all um, are at least somewhat familiar with um, through the news and some of the most recent, um, recent outbreaks. And so this is also a viral hemorrhagic fever. Um, you can kind of see why it's named. This is a filovirus, which is Latin for thread. And you can see the structure there, kind of a long, skinny, uh, skinny single-stranded RNA structure. There are six different subtypes of Ebola. And so you can see the Zaire Ebola virus is the one that we have most heard about, but then Sudan Ebola virus has been in the news lately um, for good reason. And you can see some others listed there as well. Um, uh, you know, some are not necessarily pathogenic to humans um, and others uh, are kind of new discoveries with no human cases yet associated. So Ebola was discovered in 1976 uh, near the Ebola River, which is now the Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, formerly Zaire. Um, and since then, there have been a, a, quite a few sporadic outbreaks in Africa, um, the largest in 2014, 2016, um, that we, you know, resulted in a lot of cases. So more than 28,000 cases absolutely eclipsed any other previous outbreak um, of Ebola and any, any that we've seen since then. Uh, there were 11,000 deaths associated with that outbreak. And that was the outbreak that resulted in multiple individuals being medically evacuated um, from Africa to the United States and to other countries around the world for clinical care. Um, and we were able to, we cared for three of those individuals um, at uh, UNFC Nebraska Medicine in 2014. And then also um, a, um, quite a few individuals who had had high risk exposures in Africa were brought to us uh, for quarantine as well in 2015. So since then, so, uh, there have been a, a you know, a myriad of different outbreaks um, starting in essentially 2018 um, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, Guinea, and um, Uganda. And this is the, um, the kind of nice picture of the Ebola uh, ecology where you see some animal to animal transmission. They spill over event is typically when that animal, um, you, the human has contact with the animal and then that's how they become infected. And then you have human to human transmission. And then also, you know, survivors, um, which we're learning a lot about this disease and what uh, some of the kind of post syndromes that are associated um, in Ebola survivors. So long before there was long COVID, um, there was long long Ebola, um, which is definitely uh, definitely a real a real thing. So incubation period is anywhere between two and 21 days, um, average about a week, similar to the other barotrophic fevers. Initial symptoms are very nonspecific: fever, myalgias, headaches, feeling poorly. Um, you know, I, I mean, these are seen in lots of different diseases, uh, particularly those that are common in Africa. So things like malaria, typhoid, all of these things can present exactly in this way. Um, patients though, then progress to what we would call kind of a secretory phase where they start having profuse nausea and vomiting and watery diarrhea. And then after that um, can potentially go on to have those more severe symptoms. Um, so either, either people start to get better gradually or they proceed to have multi-organ failure, shock, um, hemorrhage and death. Um, I do want to point out, though, that although these are called viral hemorrhagic fevers and Ebola virus disease, there's only about 18% of patients actually do go on to hemorrhage. Um, and I will say that when we cared for our three patients, we did not have overt hemorrhage in any of our patients. Um, you know, there was some bleeding from some of the IV sites and things like that. But, but although, although that's technically the name, uh, you may not necessarily see hemorrhage in individuals with Ebola. So just something, something to remember. And it differs a bit from, from the textbook. So I put this up here just because the virus and actually really all of these can really affect any organ system. And we saw that in real time in 2014 when we cared for our patients. Um, and so you can see the myriad of different complications and, uh, and you know, uh, severe disease that can occur with, uh, with Ebola infection. And so diagnosis of Ebola is by PCR. And just something to note and important uh, when we're thinking about evaluating travelers is that it can take about three days from the initial onset of symptoms for PCR to actually be positive. So in other words, if you have someone who spikes a fever and they come into your facility and you, know, you detect that they've, um, you know, they're travelers, they've been you know, somewhere um, with the current outbreak, 
and you have to, in order to test them, like we test them with PCR, but then actually that does not rule it out. You actually have to test them 72 hours later in order to definitively um, rule out this disease because it does take some time actually from those initial, that initial symptom onset in order for the PCR to be positive. And then treatment of Ebola is um, definitely supportive care is a huge component of that. Um, there actually are two FDA approved drugs now um, for Zaire Ebola virus. And I wanna point out that those are only for Zaire Ebola virus, not for uh, Sudan um, Ebola virus or any of the other, um, the other subtypes. Uh, the two agents you can see there, they're monoclonal antibodies, a single one and, um, and a cocktail. But, um, but again, that's a, a huge improvement from what we had in 2014, which was really uh, not much and, um, and some very, very experimental products at that time. Unfortunately, we have uh, two that kind of fell out as being um, efficacious to treat this disease. And so there's also a vaccine that was approved by the FDA in 2019, uh, the Erbibo vaccine. And this is a live attenuated, um, uh, it's a vesicular stomatitis virus. So it's a type of virus uh, that, um, uh, they essentially put a gene um, for one of the uh, Ebola strains into that virus, and then that's how it's delivered. Um, this vaccine actually, again, was approved in 2019 by our FDA, and it's been used a whole lot for to try to uh, to kind of halt outbreaks as they occur in Africa. So over 400,000 people have been vaccinated. Um, the caveat with this is that this vaccine is only effective against that Zaire Ebola virus. So it has no use against Sudan Ebola virus or others. And there are other vaccines that are in uh, clinical trials um, for Sudan Ebola virus, but just understand that both of those products and this vaccine can only be used if you know that you're dealing with uh, Ebola Zaire or Zaire Ebola virus. And so situation update, um, you know, Ebola virus disease, I, you know, we're gonna continue to see outbreaks. The Sudan virus disease outbreak in Uganda that occurred um, it was declared over on January 6th, 2023, resulted in a lot of cases. So 164 cases and 55 deaths. So very significant you know, scenario. Um, there was actually a recent case reported in the Democratic Republic of the Congo as well. And some of these cases, there's some thoughts that these new outbreaks are actually triggered by a person, uh, you know, people who have been infected a long time ago. Ebola can live in certain bodily fluids for long periods of time. And so sometimes these outbreaks are actually triggered by, um, by individuals that are survivors. And so they can have viral persistence. And this is something that we're learning a whole lot more about. All right, so lastly, uh, here's some resources that I just wanted you to be aware of. Um, I use these on a, a daily, weekly, if not daily basis, I would say. Um, some of them are email subscription services. We have a great one through the UNMC Global Center for Health Security. Um, uh, Johns Hopkins also has a really nice newsletter. There are a variety of different websites that you can use to get up-to-date information um, on special pathogens, uh, whether that's clinical or infection control or other things. Um, I use the ProMed um, uh, website a whole lot. Actually, they're very good about, uh, about providing timely updates and similar with CDC and World Health Organization and uh, NETEC also, our uh, Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center it also has a really excellent website with lots of, uh, you know, lots of different uh, resources there. All right, so I will stop now and I will turn transition over to Jackson, um, who as mentioned earlier, is our uh, regional special pathogens program coordinator um, and also a team member of the Nebraska Biocontainment Unit and the National Quarantine Unit. Awesome, thank, thank you, Dr. Hewlett. Um, I think you did a really awesome job of, of calling out all these pathogens and our, our need to kind of remain vigilant for them. So, uh, can everyone see my slides okay? Or are you seeing the presenter side? So I just wanted to give you all a, a brief history over the um, RESPECT Center. So um, that very first bullet point I'm going to call out, it's kind of the most famous event. Um, so this is the care of patients with Ebola virus disease um, and monitoring, monitoring individuals with, with these high-risk exposures. After that event, we kind of jumped down to 2015 when NITEC is created. Um, NITEC was created through UNMC Nebraska Medicine, Emory University Hospital, and then Bellevue New York Hospital. It's kind of a consortium to kind of lead this larger preparedness group. Um, in 2016, NITEC began to um, create these educational programs and courses, um, and then beginning to kind of conduct readiness assessments to identify some additional centers. Um, after these readiness consultations occurred, we, they onboarded seven additional respect centers. Um, and then this kind of, again, increased the availability of, of educational resources, materials, and education going out. 
um, in 2020. Obviously, we're all well aware of the, the COVID pandemic began and then need tech kind of went through some rebranding. Um, so moving away from that um, e Ebola centric training and education center and really coming into a more all pathogens, um, emerging special pathogens, emerging special pathogens training and education center. And then just within this last year, um, you know, three additional respect centers have been added and then subsequently added to that NETEC network as well. So then here is just kind of a quick overview of a map of all the respect centers um, nationally. So obviously there are 10 HHS regions. Um, so there is at least one respect center per the 10 um, HHS regions. You might note that region three, four, and five have two respect centers there. And those are the newest three respect centers to kind of enter in this um, respect center network. So obviously, um, being a respect center is kind of different for everyone, um, but there's some pretty core capabilities that we must um, kind of maintain, um, and some of them are, are pretty obvious. So the very first one is op maintaining our operational readiness to receive and care for patients with special pathogens, um, facilitate comprehensive reviews of the state and regional CONOPS, which is a larger guiding document that kind of tells you what your role is within um, the, the care and management of special pathogens um, care of individuals. Um, the third one is to serve as a NETEC force amplifier, so upholding the standards and guidance, and then also serving as a NETEC subject matter experts um, in the development of education and kind of things of that nature. And this last uh, core capability is something that we're really going to hit on hard today. So it's to provide technical assistance, training, education, outreach um, to all the healthcare institutions and EMS organizations inside of our region, which is um, inclusive of Nebraska, Iowa, Kansas, and Missouri. And some of the ways that we do that is through our outreach program. So we have an EMS work group meeting. We also have a healthcare facility work group meeting where we kind of talk about um, available training, education, not only by need tech, but also kind of expressing our ability to provide that training and education as well. We also talk about current challenges that healthcare is facing and give um, a brief overview of the special pathogens that are in outbreak mode at that time. Um, we also have a pretty robust email distribution list. So whenever a special pathogen outbreak occurs, we send that out to our, to our email list just so everyone's kind of well aware. Um, and then additionally, we, we also partner with other federal programs um, and kind of do very similar things as to what we're doing today. So doing a lot of, a lot of webinars, a lot of um, just overall updates of the respect centers. Um, additionally, we do education. So um, obviously, whenever you guys reach out to us, you know, we can provide some links to some new tech resources, but we can also... Um, you know, create our own education through NETEC resources and tailor a little bit more specific to you and your agency's needs. And then something that we're really excited about this, this year is our training program. So um, we can do training programs for EMS agencies, um, you know, that covers identify, isolate, and inform. What does wrapping an ambulance look like? PPE, donning, and doffing. We can really kind of tailor whatever your institution is looking for and make it specific to your institution just so it, it kind of means a little bit more. Um, we can also do the same exact thing for um, healthcare facilities as well. And this really kind of allows you to pick and choose what, is, what it is exactly that you want from us. Um, so we can kind of provide that in the best ways possible. And then also with this training aspect as well, you know, if you ever have a question about your policies or procedures or, you know, is our workflow looking correct, feel free to reach out to us because we're more than, more than excited to kind of look through your policies that, and procedures and provide a little bit of feedback um, just so you guys can work more efficiently and effectively and things of this nature. So you, you might be thinking to yourself now, how do you request this, this education training? So one of the easiest ways is to just send me an email directly. It's jgruber at nebraskamed.com. But on the RDHRE website, you can also go to the biological specialty team um, and there's a, a new clickable link there. Um, and whenever you click that, training request form. It'll go directly to um, a form where you just have to put in your first and last name, an email, and then a brief description of what it is that you're looking for. And that'll get directly routed to us as well. We'll, we'll pull our education team together and then um, talk about, you know, what's the soonest timeline that we can get this done. And then, you know, what are the anticipated needs to kind of provide this, this training for you? Um, I know that that was a lot of, of information. So if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to put them into the Q&A function. Um, and then just really just kind of wanted to highlight some resources as well. Um, a lot of them are very similar to the ones that Dr. Hewlett shared, like the uh, Need Tech Education Center um, website, and then also our UNMC Global Center for Health Security, the, the transmission, which has a pretty cool interactive map of special pathogens outbreaks. Um, and it also provides um, links to various news centers about special pathogens as well. Um, 
But other than that, feel free to send me an email, jgruber at nebraskamed.com, and I'm gonna turn it over to Warren. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jackson. Thanks, Dr. Hewlett. So great presentation today. We appreciate um, the work put together. So I do have a couple questions. Jackson, do you guys offer any virtual training or is everything in a person? And then what's the cost to the uh, facility? So when it comes to virtual training, the Respect Center alone does not have virtual training, at least not not yet, but NeTech has some, some great training and education resources on their website. And these are more like modular um, education so you can get out of it and then come back into it as well. Um, when it comes for cost of training, there is no cost for this training. So, you know, we have funding set aside from our, from our grant that um, helps us to, you know, be able to go out to these different areas and provide that training and education. Something that we are really excited or really hopeful for is that, you know, if an agency does, you know, request a training, they can, um, you know, be able to open it up to a large group of individuals just so we can kind of get our, our hands on more individuals as well. Awesome. Thanks, Jackson. And then you said you do uh, healthcare facilities and EMS agencies. Does that include long-term care or rehab? It can. It can. Absolutely. Great. Dr. Hila, if someone has someone in their facility that comes in and they're just stuck or can't figure out what it is, is there an easy way for them to access the respect or if they need help with consultation or do they go through NETEC? How do they access those resources? Well, I would say I'd probably start um, just because the individual is presenting locally. I would probably start with the local health department, um, just making sure that they are aware of the scenario. Um, we definitely we have a, an access number um, uh, that um, that we can share that actually, you know, would connect you with our uh, uh, the regional treatment center uh, here at Nebraska Medicine. Um, but with any of those cases, I definitely would start with your with your local authorities, just because no matter what, they're presenting locally and they need to be aware of the scenario. Um, there's also, you know, potential for need for contact tracing and other things as well. And so that's really important to make sure that your local authorities are fully aware of the scenario. Um, but if you need to, um, if you if you feel like you need to reach out for, um, you know, for advice or any of that stuff, we we have a number that um, that we can uh, we can put you in touch with, and I can I can find that shared. Thanks. Yeah, great. Thank you. So does anyone have any other questions today for the Q&A, our presenters? Okay, I think we will go ahead and thanks everyone for attending today. We'll get the, um, the continuing inf education information is in the chat or you can send us an email and then we'll get a copy of the slides and the webinar recording posted to our website within three to five days. So Thank you, Jackson, and thank you, Dr. Hewlett, for your time today. Oh, hold on, one question. Oh, thank you, very well done. Thanks, everyone.